the screen is yours. Okay, so I want to thank everybody that uh, organizes uh, that organized this event. It's a pleasure and and very nice of you to come and show up. Um, this talk will be about the regularity of the min-max of Blackwell Borel games. This is something that Iran already mentioned yesterday. It's about the approximation and we, with the closed set and open sets, and I will go into the details soon. And mainly I will emphasize how we can apply this thing that we refer to as regularity to get a equilibrium existence result and characterization of the set of equilibrium pair of results. Sometimes we refer to this as folk theorems. And this is the first out of three results that are all part of an ongoing project of researching this topic, uh, all together with uh, uh, Janusz Flesch and Arkady Prentuczynski from Maastricht University and Elon Solan from Tel Aviv University. So, okay. Please do not hesitate to interrupt and ask questions. I can only see part of your view you in the screen and uh, I don't think I can see the, oh, I can see the chat. Okay. I probably can see the chat, but better if you just speak up. Uh, you saw already several results that enable me to put the current work in context. So Ron Peretz dedicated one slide in his talk hello, hello. to tell us about, <laughs> is there a question already? No? Okay. Uh, Ron Peretz uh, dedicated one slide in his talk to tell us about Gale and Stewart result from 53. They considered zero-sum games with alternating moves uh, and with winning sets. That is, there is a set W, player one wins if the infinite play is in this set and player two wins otherwise. And they proved that if the winning set of player one is either open or closed, then the game is determined, meaning either there is a winning strategy for player one or there is a winning strategy for player two. One also told you about the work of Martin from 75, saying that such games, meaning zero sum, alternating moves with winning sets, such games are determined for all winning sets that are Borel measurable. So not necessarily open or closed, anything Borel measurable. Then Janusz told us about the work of Mertens and Neyman. Uh, this work goes beyond zero sum and winning sets. So the question was no longer whether the game is determined, meaning whether uh, whether a player can win, necessarily win the game, but so whether there is an equilibrium or an epsilon equilibrium. Finally, one told us in his second talk about the work of Martin from 98, showing that in zero sum simultaneous move games, so now the players are allowed to move simultaneously, a value exists. So a value is the equilibrium payoff when the game is zero sum, so an equilibrium exists, a value exists. Our work will deal with a multiplayer non-zero sum games, so like Mertens and Neyman, but simultaneous moves, when the players move simultaneously. So it's different than uh, from the models I just described. Here is the talk outline, what I'm gonna say. The main uh, result that we have concerns game with tail measurability, meaning either winning sets that are tail measurable or pair of functions that are tail measurable. So first thing I'm gonna do is tell you what tail measurability actually is. Then I will be able to state the results that we're having. I shall remind you quickly about an equilibria and epsilon equilibria, exactly what it is. And then we discuss a little bit properties of the min-max. Specifically, afterwards, we'll talk about regularity of the min-max. This is the approximation thing that, again, Iran already mentioned yesterday. And then how to use the regularity of the min-max for showing equilibrium existence in games with tail measurable sets and tail measurable payoffs. 
and to characterize the set of equilibrium payoffs. Sometimes we call this a fault theorem. So this is the general plan. And again, please interrupt me if anything is not sufficiently clear. Think about infinite horizon games with winning sets. With many players, each player has a winning set such that her payoff is the characteristic function of this set. So one, if the play is inside this set and zero otherwise. Specifically, we are interested in tail measurable sets. So when is a set of plays tail measurable? When the membership of a play in the set does not change when we change the actions played in finitely many periods. In other words, we have two plays here. I hope you can see my cursor. Uh, yes, you can, okay. So this is one play, P, A1, A2, and so on. And here are K action profiles, B1, B2, up to BK. Q is tail measurable if for every play that belongs to Q, if we replace the first K action profiles with any K action profiles here, B1 to BK, then the resulting play still belongs to Q. So replacing a finite number of action profiles does not affect the membership of this play in the set. In other words, if two plays coincide from a certain period on, and one of them belongs to W, it belongs to the winning set here, Q, then the other one belongs to the uh, tail set as well. I have here. a question. Yeah. I have, a question. Are there, I, I have the impression that there must be other names for this concept. It's uh, like, like prefix free or something of that sort. Maybe, maybe. I am yeah. not aware of other names, but uh, I actually, my guess would be that you're right. <laughs> Yeah. Prefix independence, I think you mean, right? Prefix independence? Hmm. Maybe. I, I think with, with prefix independence, you don't need to respect the land, land when you when you replace. So you can you get something shorter or you just prepend something. So if, if it's true word, then, then the prefix you would replace this, it would still be true. It doesn't, don't need to, to that the replacement as long as the object that you replace. Okay. So there is something in your in your definition that is uh, more active and that is specific. I haven't seen it in it in the way before. Okay, I know it's related to something that is called, I believe, shift invariance, but this is a slightly different. It's not the same. Yeah. Shift invariance. Um, you can think of sh of a uh, tail sets that uh, that are not shift invariant. So here are examples of uh, tail measurable sets. The set of plays in which some player I plays a certain action AI infinitely often. The set of plays in which a certain action profile is played with limb soup frequency of say at most half. The set of plays in which a certain action profile is played at most finitely many times at even periods without any specific condition on the odd period. So you can see that uh, this is not shift invariant. Okay? If we shift it one, then we change the membership, okay? Because of the odd and even. So these are tail measurable sets. And tail measurable sets of plays form a sigma algebra that is different than the Borel sigma algebra. We also discuss tail measurable payoff functions. So what are these? When is a payoff function tail measurable? So given a play, whenever we change the action profiles in finitely many periods, we get the same payoff as in the original play. So the same idea behind it, take some play P, A1, A2, and so on, replace K action profiles, if the function G is tail measurable, then it will assign the same value to the two plays, the one before the replacement or after the replacement. Again, if two plays coincide from a certain period on, then the function assigns the same value to them. More formally, a function is called tail measurable if for every real number, the set of plays whose payoffs are at least that number is a tail set. 
examples for tail measurable functions. So suppose that we have some per period payoff. So for every one period action profile, there is a function that gives us a real number that we can think of as the payoff of player i for this action profile, okay? The numbers represent the payoff. Uh, so we have an infinite stream of payoffs and we need to determine how the player evaluates an infinite stream of payoffs. So here are some evaluations that are tail measurable. If we consider, for example, the limb soup of the averages of these uh, payoffs, then we get a tail measurable set. If we simply think of the limb inf of the payoffs, then it is tail measurable. If we take sum of two tail measurable functions, then we end up with a tail measurable function. However, the sometimes popular discounted sum is not tail measurable, okay? Because it's not true that you can replace a finite number of action profiles and still get the same payoff. There are also classical computer science evaluation criteria. Uh, Buki, Kobuki, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing the names, Parity, Muller, and street objectives that are tail measurable, though these objectives would usually be defined for graph games and expressed using state spaces. Um, they all have natural analogous in the setup of Blackwell games. So now that we know what are tail measurable sets and what are tail measurable functions, I can state the results. So we consider non-zero sum simultaneous move games with tail measurable payoffs. The number of players doesn't need to be two, it can be larger than that. And I will emphasize two results. One result of existence, any simultaneous smooth Borel game with finite number of players, finite action sets, and bounded tail measurable payoff functions admits an epsilon equilibrium for every epsilon. And also a characterization result. And I will give you the exact characterization when we get there. So a characterization of the set of limits of epsilon equilibrium payoffs as epsilon goes to zero. So this is going to be the results. I know you already heard that, so I'm gonna be quick just to remind you in case it's very early in the morning and you uh, are still half asleep. So what's an equilibrium and what's an epsilon equilibrium? Well, first, what is a game? So we have the set of players we denote it by I. Each player has his or her set of actions and his or her payoff function. An equilibrium, a vector of strategies, one strategy for each player, such that a single player deviating to a different strategy, playing a different strategy than the one assigned to him by the vector of strategies in the equilibrium, while all other players still conform to their equilibrium strategy, well, such a behavior is not profitable. Okay, you cannot gain by, a, by unilateral deviations. And an epsilon equilibrium is basically the same, only we say that the player cannot gain more than epsilon by unilaterally deviating. And uh, there is a, uh, an example of why we need epsilon equilibrium, but I think you already saw some examples in the previous talks of games where there is no equilibrium, but there are epsilon equilibrium. If there is some demand from the public, we can go <laughs> through another example, but uh, if not, we can uh, move forward as you wish. So sometimes we, we don't have a, a, an exact equilibrium, but we have epsilon equilibrium for every epsilon, and this is why it's sometimes useful. The min max. Galit, I think yeah. in the chat there was a wish oh. to show such an example. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I, I don't see the chat very well. Yeah, that's why I'm jumping in. <laughs> okay. So why epsilon equilibrium? Good question. <laughs> I have just the answer for that. So here is an example of a game that does not have a exact equilibrium, but has an epsilon equilibrium. So um, think of a game with one player that has two actions and he can do, uh, they are called a and b 
And this is period one. And if he chooses action A in period one, his his payoff is zero. And if he to and the, and the game ends. And if he chooses B, then we move forward to period two. And in period two, again, he gets to choose between action A and action B. And if he chooses uh, A on period two, he gets a payoff of half. And if he chooses B, then the game goes on. Period three is again between A and B. If he chooses A, then he gets a payoff of two thirds. And if he chooses B, then the game goes on. And I think by now you understand it. Uh, the payoff depends on the first time that you choose action A after a, some finite stream of Bs. But if you choose B forever, okay, generally speaking, if you, cho if you choose A after period T, at period T, then your payoff is one minus one minus T. But if you choose B forever, then you get a payoff of zero. So of course you can get as close to one as you wish, you just, choose B many times, okay, enough uh, for a long enough number of times, and then you choose A. So you can approximate the payoff of one as closely as you wish, but there is no strategy that gives you exactly one. So there is nothing that is an exact equilibrium uh, even for the player with himself. Oh, I can see there are many things on the chat. Um, Okay, just let me know if there is something that I need to refer to in the chat. <laughs> so this is an example of a game that has only epsilon equilibrium and no exact equilibrium. Okay, no equilibrium exists, epsilon equilibrium, however, it does. And that dot doesn't go back to where we are. So I'll say, oh, and now you get a preview. Now you know all the answers. <laughs> Sorry, it was supposed to get me back, but now it's stuck. Okay, now we're back. Sorry for that. So the min-max. Uh, let's, let's discuss the min-max. The min-max value of a player in non-zero-sum game is basically the payoff that a player can defend knowing the strategies of the opponent. Similarly to a game with uh, two players. Specifically, if the game is a game with winning sets, then we're discussing the min-max of the probability to get into the winning set. So generally speaking, it's the best that a player can defend with, uh, to get given her uh, payoff function. And specifically with winning sets, it's the best probability that she can get to get into the winning set. So the min max is going to be the main tool that we use to prove the existence and to prove the fault theorem. First thing I'm gonna tell you is that the min max is not always so well behaved. Hmm? Okay, this is what I wanted. The min max is monotone in, why it's, sorry, it's just jumping here. Okay, I think I fixed it, let's see. I think I fixed it. Okay, my mouse is jumping around. Um, the minmax is monotone in the following sense. If we're looking at the minmax of a sequence of increasing sets, then this minmax is non-decreasing. Okay, an increasing sequence of sets, the minmax is uh, non-decreasing. However, it's not continuous in the following sense. There exists an increasing sequence of Borel sets. C1 is a subset of C2, is a subset of C3, and so on, such that when Cj is the winning set of player one, the min max of the limit set is not equal to the limit set of the min max. We denote the min max by V, by small v, okay? To convince you of that, I will show you an example. So consider a game with two players, player one and player two, a zero sum game. The winning set of player one depends only on the actions of player two. And player two has two actions in each period, A and B. 
And now we begin to define an increasing sequence of winning sets. So the first set that we define is B0, and it consists of two plays, the play of playing infinitely many times A and the one where we play infinitely many times B. BK is a set of plays that begins with the, all the plays that begin with playing K times action A and then action B. CJ, now we define the increasing sequence of winning sets, is the union of all the Bs from K equals zero to K equals J. What does it mean? It's the set of plays, CJ is the set of plays such that it's either always A or always B or K times A followed by B and then continues however, okay? Now let's think about the min max of these CJs. So if we think of a finite J, 100, 500, okay? Any finite J, it's clear that player two can avoid getting into this CJ. All he needs to do is to play J plus one times A and then B and then whatever, and then we're out of CJ. So for every finite J, the min max of CJ is zero. Therefore, when we take the limit, it is still zero. On the other hand, if we look at the limit set, the limit set of CJ when J goes to infinity, this is simply all the plays because each and every play you can think about is either all A or all, all B or begins with some number of A's followed by B. And therefore, the value of the limit is one. So the limit of the values is not equal to the value of the limit. It has to, it needs to be not equal. So it's not always well behaved. It still has an attribute again that was mentioned yesterday that we will heavily use sometimes something that we call regularity from probability theory. We know that the probability measure is a regular operator. This means that given a probability measure and a set W under conditions that are not too restrictive, the probability of a set is equal to the supermoon of the probabilities of closed subsets of that set. This is sometimes called inner regularity and also equal to the infimum of the probabilities of open supersets of uh, W. This is sometimes called outer regularity. And it turns out that similar attributes hold for the min max and yeah, I got my most work. So similar attributes work for the min max. Again, as Iran mentioned yesterday, Martin in 98 and Mitra Sadat and Perz in 92 proved the regularity of the min max in the case of two players. We generalize it to more than two players. And the proof method is similar to Martin and similar in other aspects to Mitra Sadat and Perv. We use an auxiliary alternating move games where player one, you, you saw this method already, tries to prove that uh, a value can be obtained. Uh, player two tries to prove him wrong or player one wrong. So similar methods, slight alter alternation and the proof works for more than two players. And this is the thing that we will use, that we will employ to get existence of equilibrium and to get the characterization of the set of equilibrium pairs. So now for the proof, existence of equilibrium for games with tail measurable winning sets. One remark for the regularity result that I just mentioned, the number of actions can be countable. However, for the applications for game with tail measurable sets of payoffs, we assume that the number of actions available for each player is finite, okay? And I will tell you if you want exactly where we use this finiteness assumption because uh, it's important. So we have a number of players. Each one of them has a winning set, WI for player I, and this winning set is assumed to be tail measurable. 
I will tell you exactly when we use attributes of tail measurability, when we use the implications of tail measurability, what does it imply? Why do we assume that? But for now, each player has a winning set that is tail measurable, and we try to generate an equilibrium. The key to generate an equilibrium here is to find a play path such that the payoff is at least as high as the min max for each one of the players. So the winning set of player I is WI. And here is the first implication of the assumption that the uh, plays are tail measurable. I claim that the min max of this WI is either zero or one. Moreover, it is either zero after any history or one after any history. To get some intuition as to why it is either zero or one, let's suppose, let's entertain the thought that it is one half. Then a player has a strategy that guarantees that she gets into the winning set with probability half. From Levy zero one law, there is some period T far enough along the play such that with probability close to half, at period T, the player knows that she wins almost for certain that she is winning inside the winning set. And with probability half, she knows almost for certain that she is lost, that she is outside of the set. But the set is tail. So this finite T when this realization comes along, it doesn't matter, okay? She can restart this strategy and get another probability half in case she finds out that she is lost. She gets another chance, another probability of one half to enter the winning set. So I hope this convinces you that if she has a probability of half, then she has a probability half plus half times half, and then so on and so forth. So she can have infinitely many opportunities to get into the winning set. And therefore, if she has a probability of half, she has a probability of one, basically. So it's either zero or one, the min max. And we want to play where each player gets at least their min max value. For the players whose min max is zero, this is not a challenge, right? Any play gives them their min max value, which is zero. That's not a problem. So we can assume, we can just for now disregard these players, we ignore them, and we assume that all players have a min max value of one. Okay, so now we want to find a play that is in the intersection of all the WIs, okay, of all the players, because we assume everybody has a min max value of one. So now we use the inner regularity. We approximate the winning set WI with a closed set CI, such that the min max of the closed set is one minus epsilon. Next, we define a set, CIM, the set of plays where after M periods, there exists some continuation that is in CI, some continuation. Player I is not totally lost, comes period M. Observe that this is a superset of CI because you just need some continuation to be inside. So CI is a subset of CIM. So remember this set, CIM, the set of plays where after M periods, there is a continuation that is in CI. CI is the closed inner approximation of WI. Yeah, okay, we move on. Now we define the set CIM, which is the intersection of all the players of CIM. So this is basically the set of plays where after M periods, all players are still alive, okay? In the sense that all players still has continuation payoff, the continuation of the, of the play, each one in his respective CI. Okay, so- hey, Garnet, can I ask uh, to understand this set CIM? Because yes, I'm yes, 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 yes. Uh, does it mean that um, so when you say that after M you can get into the C, does it mean, so the set Cs might not be tail measurable, right? They are okay. not. Yeah, 
right? So this is the first step to understand. Then you say, well, if I, 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 I play a way so that the play that I play, if I replace the first M steps, then I'm in C. Is that, is that the way you mean it? Again, again, I'm not sure I understand. Um, okay, are you saying uh, there is a play such that uh, when I throw away what happened in the first M steps and then replace it by the right thing and I put it together with what happens after stage M, I get a plate that is in uh, the set C. I think, I think it's not accurate. Uh, I, what I mean is, is this, the set of plays such that when you look at the first M uh, periods, there yeah. is some continuation of this first M period that is still in CI. Okay, you, okay, so I mean- You I'm find missing. a way okay. to continue it that yeah. keeps you in CI. Now note that we have I players maybe each one of them have a different continuation that keeps them in their own CI, okay? But each player needs ah, to- Ah, okay, that's the trick, okay, okay. Okay, each player <laughs> needs to have some continuation, something, some, some possible future when he's not lost, okay? Okay, so, so basically if, if that player could choose alone what happens, it could yeah. make sure uh, to be in C. Yeah, exactly. If that player was free to choose the entire it's not, it's not yet completely excluded. Uh, okay, okay. Now yes. I'm sorry, sorry for the question. No, thank okay, you. Thank you for thank the you. questions. Please, people, thank ask you. questions. <laughs> uh, yes, so CM is the set of plays where at period M, we don't have a player that is completely lost, that is outside, uh, that has no possible future in his, uh, in his CI. Okay, this is the set CM. Now let's think about the set CM. Let's think of a finite game, a game of M periods where each player tries to get into the set CIM. Okay, so this is a finite game. And in a finite game, here we use the assumption, by the way, that the set of actions is finite. Uh, in a finite game, we know that there exists an equilibrium. And moreover, we know that in equilibrium, each player gets at least her minimax value. We're gonna use this, okay? We're gonna use this. So each player gets at least VI of CIM in the finite game that has an equilibrium. Using the equilibrium strategy, a player gets at least VI of CIM. Remember that CI <clears throat> is a subset of CIM, okay? CI, uh, CIM is just all the beginnings. CI is more restrictive. And we know that the value of CI, the, the min max of CI is one minus epsilon. So in the finite game, the one that ends after M periods, and when each player just wants to get into CIM, the min max of each player is at least one minus epsilon. And since this is an equilibrium, and since in equilibrium, each player gets their, at least their min max value, it means that when all players play their equilibrium strategies in the finite game, each one of them enters their CIM with probability at least one minus epsilon, okay? So each player using equilibrium strategy in the finite game, each player enters CIM with probability at least one minus epsilon. So consider the probability induced by this equilibrium strategy in the finite game. We have here I events, each one happening with probability at least one minus epsilon. For epsilon small enough, this means that these events need to have an intersection, okay? Their intersection is not empty. Therefore, we conclude that CM is not empty, okay? This was a little bit of a lengthy explanation. So if some clarifications are needed, please ask, okay? Uh, sorry, I had a question. Yeah. Probably I didn't quite understood the definition of CIM. Okay. So for me, uh, maybe I restate what you explained to us that you spot what is confusing to me. So as understood, 
if in the set CI there is any play, because the set CI is supposed to be tail measurable, then if I look at any run there and I look at the first M part of it, the first M action and change it to anything, then I will stay in the set. No, 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 wait. wait. Uh, first, the set WI is tail measurable. The mm -hmm. set CI is not tail measurable. Okay, I think very that's tail measurable. Part. So, the, so, so this is the, the first point that maybe I was uh, not very clear about. So CI is not tail measurable. It's an approximation from the inside with a closed set of a tail measurable set, but it doesn't need to be tail measurable by itself. Okay. Okay. Thank you. It most that... probably isn't. Still, I, I want to explain some more what is the set uh, CIM because if it's confusing, then uh, it deserves a, a better explanation. Um, so the set CIM. So okay. There is WI, which is the winning set of player I. There is CI, which is the inner approximation with closed set of the set WI. Now, suppose we stop the game after M periods and we ask the players who still has a chance to get into CI, okay? If uh, player I says, I still have some continuation that allows me to get into CI. If I'm uh, able to choose the continuation, I can guarantee that I can get into CI. I can, I'm not completely lost. There is still some future where I see myself in CI. If this is true, then we are still in CIM. CIM are all the beginnings of M periods beginnings where player I can still get into CIM, where there is some continuation that leads us into CIM. When we look into the set CM, which is the intersection of all CIMs, it means that for all players, all the players still have some future when they are still each one in their respective CI. It doesn't need to be the same future for all the players, but each player needs to have a future that guarantees that he is still inside CI. So this is CIM. And when we look at the C, uh, this is CM, sorry. When we look at CM, we can use the fact that CM can be, uh, you, you can try to get into CM using a finite game to say that it needs to be not empty. It cannot be empty because if each player can have a probability of at least one minus epsilon to get into CIM, when they all use the equilibrium in the finite game, then these events have a non-empty intersection. So there has to be some play in this intersection, in this CM. Are there more questions? Galit, can you show an example where I think it's related to the previous question, but the for this explanation where CI uh, cannot be chosen to be tail measurable. Where CI cannot be chosen to, to be, be tail measurable. Um, Not the CI true. is closed. CI is closed. I mean, there are only two intra. Uh, there are only two uh, tail uh, measurable closed sets. The empty set and, and the everything. Thing. Yes, the empty set and everything. So actually, everything that is not. Thank you, Kadi. Everything that is not the empty set of or everything cannot have an inside approximation that is tail. Yes. Uh, thank you for the example because now it quite make a lot of sense because the only times that, in fact, uh, if, if uh, the, 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 the winning set was everything, then actually everything would trivially also hold. And that was a very good example. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I hope it's clear now that CM is not empty. Now I remind you our mission. We began with a mission. We wanted to find a play that is in the intersection of all the WIs, and we will find a play that is in the intersection of all the CIs. But so far, all we have is that the intersection of CIMs is not empty, so we still need one step to go. 
before we're done. Now we look, we, we increase the M. We look at CM, CM plus one, CM plus two, and so on. Observe that CM plus one is a subset of CM, okay? Because we, it's easier to still have a future that keeps you inside uh, CI when you're looking at M periods than when you're looking at M plus one periods. There are more requirements here. <clears throat> so we have um, nested non-empty compact set. Oh, sorry, my computer is making problems today. It, it chose today to make problems. So we have uh, an, we have nested non-empty compact sets, and from a Cantor intersection theorem, we know that this intersection, the intersection of all CMs, m from one to infinity, is not empty. And this intersection is exactly the set of plays where all players uh, win. All players, uh, the, 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 the plays are all in C, I, for all I's, okay? Because every, every player has a future that is inside after one period, two periods, and up to infinity. So this intersection is not empty, and therefore we can find a play that is inside all the CIs. CIs are inner approximations of WIs, so we just found a play that is in all the WIs. This enables us to build an equilibrium. How is the equilibrium working? The players play some play that is inside this intersection when all, when all players win. Now, I remind you that we disregarded the, pl the players that had a value of zero because we said, well, they, they uh, get at least zero anyhow, but now we need to consider them as well. So every player that had a min-max value of one, they get at least one. They have no profitable deviations. They get their maximal uh, payoff anyhow, so no deviation. The players that had a min-max value of zero, well, we never established what is it that they get. Maybe they get a zero, maybe they, they have one, and they possibly have profitable deviation. And the equilibrium instructs that if a player deviates from this play path, then her opponents sanction her, punish her by playing the strategy that gives the deviator the min-max value. Now, again, the payoff is tail, okay? The, the set is tail. So by deviating once, you cannot enter your winning set, okay? And you can always be punished down to your uh, min-max level after any finite period. So this punishment is effective regardless of when it was initiated. So for the players who got one, they have no profitable deviations. For the players whose min-max value is zero, if they deviate, they get punished. So this is an equilibrium. We use here another attribute in tail measurability that the min max doesn't change and that deviating once, you cannot alter the, your payoff in a way that you have some positive gain. So this is, the, this is the existence of equilibrium for games with tail measurable winning sets. Now we go, we move forward, unless you have questions again, please feel free. Yeah, I, I have a question. Is yeah. the chance, this is not sub game perfect, right? Because um, it might not be in the interest of the other players to punish deviator, right? Correct. Uh, uh, is there a way of, you know, spicing it up that, you know, uh, they don't need to, I mean, I haven't thought about this ever. You know, maybe they just need to punish for finally many periods or something to make sure that that guy doesn't get into his good set and then they can go back to, you know, yeah. uh, to basically the set C. I mean, yeah. uh, just changing the be beginning or something. I see your concern, but can and nothing that you can do during finitely many periods has any effect, right? So, yeah, so so there's no way of, of punishing that guy, right? Uh, and, and getting back and still getting the good payoff for you. Uh, yeah, you can say that uh, we're going to do something and then we're going to restart, but then it's not clear what's going to be the payoff if we, he keeps deviating, for yes, example. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so, so because, you know, in repeated games with, 
you know, yeah, I know. <laughs> with discounting and so on, you can do things like this, right? You can, Sometimes, yes, yes, yes. I you know. can punish the other guy, but then you go back to what you like. And, and admit, here, here there's no chance, right? Yeah, I admit it's a tempting thought because there are proper sub games here. Uh, everybody knows everything. It's uh, tempting to think of sub game perfection, but uh, actually nothing that you, you do in a finite number of periods affects anything. So... Uh, it's not clear. Uh, so, so basically, it should actually be possible to find counterexamples where it cannot uh, where it cannot have a, a subgame perfect equilibrium. That's an, an interesting thought. I, I never thought of that. But it's I mean, that, that would make your your question. paper even stronger if you find uh, a game with such an example. That would be a, a good thing, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for this comment. It's an interesting idea. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Sorry. Interrupting. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so this this were uh, this was existence of equilibrium with tail measurable winning sets. Now let's move to tail measurable payoffs. If my mouse will allow me to move, yes, it did. Okay, <laughs> tail Sorry, measurable. I, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in the previous slide, so if yeah. there is a deviation, because the intersection of the CM may not be tail measurable. We may get out of, I mean, if one of the player, um, the one that has a pay of zero does a deviation, we may get out of CM as this intersection, but of course, I stay, I still be in W, yes? So how are we sure that still all the players that were supposed to get one, they will get one? Because um, I don't know if my question yeah, is. I, yeah, I think I understand. I will try to answer, but if I'm not answering them, <laughs> okay. So you you are right that uh, the intersection of CM is uh, I, I don't know if it's the intersection of CM is the set of plays that are in the intersection of winning sets. Winning sets are tail finite intersection of tails, I think it is tail, but uh, uh, people correct me if I'm wrong. But even if it's not, the equilibrium construction is about playing a pure play path. So we select one and it's pure. So you know exactly what everybody is supposed to be playing at each period, okay? And they're supposed to be playing that. And if somebody deviates, then they're punishing him and that's it. They punish him till the end of times. Okay, so after they punish him, there is no, there is no after. <laughs> okay, they don't go back to anything like, like traditionally they, they sometimes do in uh, repeated games that you punish for some number of, uh, and then you go back. That's not the case here. You just punish him forever. Is, is this answering your question? Yes, it does. Okay. And I think it, you might be so right that maybe this set is already tail because, I think it's tail. because yes, yes, it is yes. The intersection of finitely many tail sets. So, yes. Uh, okay. But, but again, but again, it just relies, oh, well, but again, it just relies on playing a pure, uh, a, a pure play. Okay. So now we move to tail measurable payoff functions. So <clears throat> um, we move from payoff function that is a characteristic function of some tail set to any tail measurable payoff function. We use similar methods to, sh to show that there is a play whose payoff is, uh, for each player is at least their min max minus epsilon. So the, the ideas are very much the same. First, we define for every player the set QI epsilon of his payoff, which is the set of plays where this player gets at least their value minus epsilon, their min max minus epsilon. This set is tail. And again, we go to the implications of tail measurability. The min max value is the same for all subgames, meaning no finite history matters to what is the min max of the game. Okay, so, and, uh, the prob and, the, and because this set is tail set, the probability of getting into that set, the min max probability of getting into that set is either one or zero. The min max of that set, if we consider it to be the winning set is either one or zero. But because this is the min max minus epsilon, the player can guarantee this payoff, so it has to be one. 
So the min max of, uh, of this uh, set is one, and then we can employ similar reasonings that we had before to show that there is a play that is in the intersection of all these uh, QI epsilons for every epsilon. So this is basically repeating the same uh, technique. And again, the equilibrium, you pick one such play and we play it forever or until a player deviates. And if a player deviates and he's being punished forever with his min max, and this is uh, and two epsilon equilibrium. So this is uh, just generalization of uh, the payoff function that is uh, the characteristic function of a tail set. Okay, so this is for existence of equilibrium and epsilon equilibrium. Now we move to characterization of the payoffs that we can obtain in equilibrium. The term fault theorem in game theory refers to a theorem that characterizes the set of equilibrium payoffs, usually within a repeated game framework. In this setting, since sometimes you already saw epsilon equilibrium does not exist, we focus, uh, it's, sorry, exact equilibrium does not exist, we focus on epsilon equilibrium. And we ask what is the set of payoffs that are the limits of epsilon equilibrium payoffs as epsilon goes to zero? What's the limit set? What's the set of payoffs that can be approximated with epsilon equilibrium payoffs for decreasing epsilons? To better understand what we mean by that, let's consider an example and try to characterize a set of equilibrium payoffs in the example. So we have a sympathetic game of two players, player one and player two. Player one has three actions, top, middle, and bottom. Player two has three actions, left, center, and uh, right. And we have a small notation for an action profile A1, A2, and a number N, we denote a hashtag A1, A2, N to be the number of times the action profile A1, A2 was played during the first N periods. So you can kind of guess it's going to depend on frequency of using different action profiles. And these are the details of the payoffs. If the limb in frequency Okay, the, the limit frequency of the two action profiles combined, TL and MC together, is above half, then the payoff is 1-1. One, one. So if they manage to play these action profile, these two action profiles here, the sum of their frequencies with a limb in of at least half, then they end up each gaining one. If the limit of the frequency of BL is one, then the payoff is 4-1. Now I'm gonna put it in the matrix and I'm asking you not to be confused because usually when we put payoffs in matrix, we refer to pair period payoffs, but that's not the case here. I just couldn't find a better graphical way to, <laughs> to help you realize what's going on. So be aware, it's not pair period. This is what you get if the limit of playing this set is, uh, of the frequency of playing this cell is one. And similarly here, minus one four, if the limit of the frequency of playing this is one. For all other things, the payoff is zero. So zero, 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 zero everywhere else, or in cases that we don't reach these frequencies and play all over the place. Now, let's take a look at this uh, matrix. Observe that if player one plays forever B, okay, B, 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 then the maximum player one can get is zero. And this is the min max of player two, okay? So this is the min max action of player one. This is when player one is min max in player two, and the min max payoff is zero. Similarly, you can see it's symmetric. So similarly, if player two is playing R, 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 then the best that player one can do is zero, and this is the min max. So we know the game, it has four, possible payoffs, okay, four possible realizations of payoffs. We know what is the min max, now what is the folk theorem here? What can the players actually obtain in equilibrium? Okay, so it's clear, or I think it's clear that the players can coordinate on getting the one-one. 
say they decide to play uh, half, uh, almost half of the time T, TL and I don't know, some of the time CN, okay? They can coordinate on that and suppose that if somebody deviates is punished by the min max, so one one is obtainable for an equilibrium. Zero zero is also easy to obtain. If both players min max each other forever, nobody has a profitable, devi a profitable deviation, you get zero zero. So we can get one one and we can get zero zero. This, this much we know for now. Furthermore, there is a paper by uh, Solan, Solan and Solan that tells us that the players can use the first periods of the play to conduct joint lotteries. Now, I won't go into the details of joint lotteries. If somebody is interested, you can share the, the link to this interesting paper. Joint lotteries use the randomizations that the players perform over their actions to generate any distribution over outcomes in such a way that no single player can affect the result by deviating and altering, altering his own actions. So, we, for now, we just use it as a black box. We can assume that the players can together randomize over, um, over whatever they want. So it's clear that they can randomize between 0, 0 and 1, 1 and get any distribution of 0, 0. So in expectancy, they can get any payoff between 0, 0 and 1, 1. Let's take a look at the graph. Okay, so here are the payoffs, the possible payoffs of this game. We have zero, zero here. We have one, one here. We have four minus one here and minus one, four here. So far, our analysis told us the following thing. The players can get zero, zero here. The players can get one, one here. The players can get joint randomizations to get all this segment connecting one, one and, and zero, zero. Fine. What about the other payoffs? For example, it's very tempting, especially if you're familiar with folk theorems in repeated games, it's very tempting to think, what about randomizing with probability half this and half this? You get one half, one half in expectation. That's way better than one, one, and zero, zero, okay? Can we do that? Can we do that? <laughs> no, we cannot do that. Um, we cannot do that because Indeed, we can randomize between minus one, four, and four minus one. But if the realization of this randomization is going to be, for example, four minus one, then player two will have a profitable deviation. Minus one is below their payoff function, below their min max. So we cannot obtain it. So if we look at, they, they can, uh, they can randomize over different payoffs so we can consider convex hull of payoffs. But if we try to consider the convex hull of feasible payoffs, that's the dashed line here, and see which part of it is above the min max level, that's the yellow triangle here. We cannot get that yellow triangle as much as we want because this means putting some positive weight, some positive probability on plays where if these are the realized plays, then a player has a profitable deviation, okay? We cannot place any probability on plays that give us uh, four minus one or minus one four. So out of all these feasible payoffs, all we can obtain is this segment, connecting zero, zero and one, one. So here is a generalization of this theorem. So here we had a finite number of pairs. So uh, um, it was, we didn't need epsilons, but generally speaking, I remind you of the set QI epsilon, which is the set of plays that uh, give a player I at least their min max minus epsilon. So let's think of this uh, set here. For player one, it's the set of plays that give him at least zero. Where does player one get at least zero? Zero, zero, one, one, and minus one, four. These three points are in Q, uh, one epsilon for epsilon small enough. What is it for player two? Zero, zero, one, one. Player two needs to get at least zero. So zero, zero, uh, one, one, and four, uh, and 
sorry, I confused you. Before it was 0, 0, 1, 1 and 4 minus 1. This is for player 1. And now for player 2, 0, 0, 1, 1 and minus 1, 4. Q epsilon f is the intersection. So in the intersection only leaves us with 0, 0 and 1, 1. These are the two payoffs that, uh, the two feasible payoffs where each player gets at least their min max value. And uh, WF is the, the payoffs themselves. So we, before it was the plays that give 0, 0, and 1, 1. So W is 0, 0, and 1, 1 themselves. And the set of equilibrium payoffs is the convex hull. Here, closure is not relevant because we have two points, so it's not relevant. But generally, it can be the convex hull of the closure of these two points. So here, it's simply the segment connecting 0, 0, and 1, 1. Generally, it's the convex hull of the closure of this W epsilon F. So this is the Falk theorem that we get. Um, more or less, this concludes uh, what I wanted to say. Um, so if anybody, I still have some time, but uh, if anybody has any questions, now is a good time to say them. Last thing. Uh, Galit? Yeah. Uh, do, do you have any thoughts about whether this existence result can be generalized to stochastic games with limb soup, uh, limb soup payoff or a tail measurable payoff? Yeah, Elon will tell you about <laughs> I think, uh -huh. I think, <laughs> yes, uh, the, the, definitely, definitely. But I, I leave that to Elon. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, actually, I, I thought that you wanted to ask about, yes, I prepared this slide yesterday after your talk, <laughs> that uh, the, regu the regularity result, uh, because you promised the crowd to have limb soup uh, functions in my talk. So I added mm -hmm. the slide with lim soup functions. So uh, the regularity result is not just for sets, it's also for functions in the natural uh, way. So that, that's another result that we generalize from two players to, to many players. Yes. Okay. Thanks. More questions. <laughs> okay. Then maybe we take an early break. <laughs> May I ask a simple question? Sure. Uh, I think when you explain the mass graph with the yellow part oh, and yeah. the hash part, yes, yes. So I yeah. think I understand why the white hash part is not, um, it's not helpful to get an equilibrium. But the yellow part is slightly surprising for me because it's mm -hmm. above the min max. Yeah. And we still don't manage to get something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I, I heartfully agree <laughs> that yeah. it's, it's surprising. But then let, let's, let's go again for this point here. It's one half, one half, uh, or this one half, that. And it's very tempting because they get one and a half, one and a half, better than any other equilibrium if we manage to get. Manage. It's very tempting to try and get it, but how can you get it? I mean, you have to play this with probability one half and this with probability one half. So you have a randomization device, fine. The randomization device tells you this is the realization. This is what you have to play. If you're a player uh, two, then you have a profitable deviation. You just found out that you're about to get minus one. You can get more. We can get more in a repeated game. We can divide. Uh, we can divide the periods such that in a repeated game with per period uh, payoffs, whether they are discounted or undiscounted, doesn't matter. Lim soup, lim inf of the average, whatever. We can divide the period such that the realized play is going to be here. The realized payoff is going to be here. Here it's just the expected payoff. The realized payoff is either this or that, and none of them are individually rational. I think this is the source of the of the disappointment that we have here, that we can get only a small thing of what we're used to in folk theory. Yeah. So 
Gali? Yeah. Um, so I, I like this very much, this, um, this, yeah. this result and work. Um, if I had that, um, another life, I would do an intern with you on, um, on Banach Mazur, Mazur in, instead of playing, um, um, Gale or like playing, playing one move at a time. So that there are these ga Banach Mazur games where you, where you can, every player can be a finite, finite number of moves and, and then the alter. And uh, the, then you have the terminacy beyond on the red. So there are set where they are not Borel and still are. you are determined. And um, this looks very compatible with the techniques sneaks they use because there, there is always a player, player who fix things for arbitrarily, but finally periods. Yeah. And then, then you go. Um, I, I mean, it could be that there you can, you can relax this, um, request to, to, to preserve lands of the products that you replace. Mm -hmm. Because I think, I mean, this gives a very nice sense of what happens in a repeated game if we take away what happens from the, in the, in the fight. So we know how to analyze finite. It, games yeah now let us look when everything happened in the tail and and it would be interesting if you could detangle a naturally a function to say this is the this is something that matters for the finite mid part this is something that is tail heavy this is in between and so so i th i think it'd be i mean this this gives a wonderful basis uh, uh but to understand like, like what, what happens between games finite, finite, finite duration where no the duration and what happens in the infinite and it, we don't care about finite fixes of no matter what length. Mm -hmm. That would be it, it, it sounds interesting. Sounds mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. I, I, I was not, uh, I'm not sure that if I understood the question. Is the question of what happens when the payoffs are not tail measurable, but kind of a mixture between a tail measurable and the, and a continuous payoff? Is that the yes, question? Yes. Question? Yeah. The, the question would be take an arbitrary, arbitrary like win condition and try to decompose, try to understand this uh, tail measurable part of your fit. And is, um, I mean, and well, it's, it's more like a concept, conceptual question. It's not, uh, anything algorithmic. I mean. So, so l l let me say one thing in a, yes. in a case where a payoffs are, some. are a function of a stream of payoffs. Yes, like in some of the examples that have been given here, they are uh, works that are that are kind of trying to break the payoff into uh, the composition of the payoffs into two parts. One that depends on the tail, one that depends on the on the stage payoff. Yeah. In the case that you have monotonicity. Yes. Yeah. Because then you could use the kind of an Ilya Yoshida theorem of a decomposition uh, of a measure. Okay. So, so if you have additional if you have additional axioms, yes, so under additional axioms there are work that yeah. will give you a, a decomposition of the payoff into two payoffs. Mm -hmm. So, so you have have classes of of pair functions where you where you know how to decompose. Correct. Yes. Yeah, because I wouldn't know. I mean, I didn't, I didn't understand the tool that you that you mentioned. I mean, I'm not. Uh... Ilya Yoshida theorem that speaks about the positive linear functional on L infinity. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, giving it a, a, a kind of a partition that it is a kind of an L1 functional plus a charge, where the charge means that it's a, a finitely, a purely finitely additive measure, mm -hmm. an extension of a purely non additive measures to functions of L infinity. Wow, this looks very interesting. Unfortunately, I have a, um, a topology guru. I, I will look at this. But but Avram, who who used it in repeated games? What are the words? 
Uh, there is one recent work of myself. Oh. Yeah. And, and th th there is uh, 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 Garciela Chislinski from 96, and she talked about the sustainable preferences. Yes. So okay. she, she basically, in terms of various economic work, she wanted to look for pay of functions mm -hmm. that are uh, both a function of the present and a function of the distant future, which is the infinity, the tail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because she, otherwise, uh, if you think of global warming or other things, you have uh, difficulties of uh, maximizing. So, so there are, uh, she has kind of characterization in the, in, in the case of just, just, basically just the translation of the Ilya Yoshida Tio, which I mentioned, and there is a recent work of mine that uh, is in addition requiring some uh, axioms of uh, the time value of money that is uh, kind of an overtaking criteria, but uh, not only in the tail, but everywhere. Very and interesting. So then there is a characterization, also some implication of uh, what you could do with optimization with such functions. Very interesting, very interesting. So uh, may I ask a question? Sure. So uh, something, uh, so this is very interesting, uh, the concept of equilibrium here is a bit, um, for me, it's like we have an infinite duration game, but the deviation that is considered can damage even if the deviation is done once uh, uh, as the classical equilibrium. Do you think it would be, because as I understand in your proof, you rely on the fact that deviation happens once or finitely many times. I think that's the crux of the, some part of the proof, yeah. So do you think if one expect that um, the concept of equilibrium here depend on deviation, a, a punishment of infinitely, like a, not only a finite duration punishment, but a continuous punishment, yes. Would it change a lot? The, is this concept even studied or does it make sense? Or can you elaborate a bit or, sorry, maybe I'm just a bit. So, so you're asking about the concept of the punishment being eternal, being forever? Yeah, well, actually the, the only way uh, to change the payoff of a deviating player is to do something forever, right? Because no, nothing you do in a finite number of periods affects the payoffs of the players here. So indeed, we can, uh, instead of punishing after deviation once, we can decide that we punish after 10 deviations of the same player. Because 10 deviations will also give him nothing, right? He also needs to deviate infinitely many times so that something will change. Uh, so this can be changed to, I believe, any finite number. But still, uh, the punishment in itself, in order to be effective, I don't see a way to avoid the punishment lasting forever. Um, I, I don't see a way to avoid it because otherwise it will have simply no effect on the payoff of the player. Anything you do a finite number of times. Yes. I, re I remember actually a paper, I think it was by Ehud and Silva, Ehud Leran and Silva, so I'm, I could be wrong, where what they do in the construction, I don't remember exactly the result, but I think it was called epsilon consistent equilibrium or something like this, that if there's a deviation, then punishment takes place, but only with some positive probability. So um, um, if the player deviates, then maybe the players make a joint lottery. And if the guy is uh, lucky with probability almost one, he will be lucky maybe, then they forget about it. And uh, with a small probability, they will punish, but then they will punish forever. So it's not sub game perfect, but it has a little bit more, but th this is the only thing I can think of. But, to be honest, I don't recall that concept exactly, so I could be very much offline here. But I think it was called epsilon consistency. I don't know, I don't know. Thank you, Galit. Further questions? Okay, then 
Thank you again.